And welcome. We're glad that you're here this morning. Glad to be with you in the house of the Lord this morning. And I uh, wanted to just say a word of welcome to you. Also, if you're visiting with us, let me point your attention to our bulletin. There's a little flap that tears off on the side of our bulletin. And we would be honored if you would fill out some information there about yourself and place that in an offering plate as it's passed so that we have a record of your visit. And um, we can extend a word of thanks to you for coming our way. Several announcements I want to mention to you before we jump into worship. Um, this evening, this afternoon, I should say, at 3 p.m., our choir will be having practice downstairs. And so if you would like to join them, uh, feel free. I'm sure Pastor Mitch would love to have you. Um, also, we talked about last week our D-Life training that we've got coming up. Several opportunities for you to learn more about D-Life and what it's all about. The first one is a boot camp, and that will be two consecutive Sunday nights, the 15th and the 22nd. And that will be from 5 to 7 p.m., and uh, there's, a, there's some cost involved in the books for the training. That's $10 each. Um, but we're having a guest come who is an expert in all things D-Life. His name's Barry Owen. He came on a Wednesday night not too long ago. And so he's going to come back and do what we call a boot camp training. That's an intensive uh, aspect of training. Then there's going to be an, a second opportunity for you to learn more and sort of participate in what D-Life looks like. This will be more of an ongoing training that will be on Wednesday nights. And that will start August the 25th, that Wednesday night, and it will run through about the middle of November. And so, again, that will be from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, during our Wednesday night time. And that will be uh, with Jeff Joyce. And so it will be more um, about what D-Life is, getting to see uh, the ins and outs and how it all works together. And so if you're interested in being discipled or if you're interested in discipling yourself, uh, we would love to have you come and be a part of that training. Well, we've got an exciting weekend coming up, August the 21st and 22nd. Uh, our pastoral candidate meet and greet weekend is that weekend. And so uh, we want to make sure that you get all the, the activities on your schedule. That uh, Saturday night, the 21st at 530, we'll be down in the CLC for a dinner together. And we're asking anybody that comes if you could bring a side dish and come and enjoy some fellowship and getting to meet um, the pastoral candidate that the pastor search team has, uh, has is wanting to present to us for our approval. And then that Sunday, uh, he will be preaching in the 10 a.m. There will be one service that Sunday. One service uh, in here, 10 a.m. So um, just keep those things in mind. We don't want you to miss out on any of that exciting stuff. I've mentioned Faith Fest to you. Let me remind you about that. We would love to have you and your family come to this uh, Christian Music Festival. It is Saturday, August the 28th. And the cost is $25 per person, but 12 and under come free. So that's why we say we'd love for you to bring your family. Uh, if you've got some little ones, I know that they would have a good time. Do sign up by August the 22nd so that we can order those tickets and get that $25 group rate. Uh, we'll be leaving here that Saturday about noon, and we'll be getting back late. I think the show ends about 10, 10.30 or something like that, so we'll be getting back late that evening. But it's a good time. We enjoyed it the last time we got to go, so we would love to have you. A couple of things to mention to our students. Uh, we've got a, a missions project coming up on the night of the 18th, that Wednesday night. From 6 to 8 p.m., we're going to be going and helping uh, a sweet lady named Helen who is heading up a project that you may have heard about, um, a, a, a back-to-school extravaganza where they're going to be handing out um, some school supplies uh, down in, uh, in Ashborough at one of the parks uh, that Saturday. I believe it's Saturday the uh, 28th. And uh, so since we're going to be at Faith Fest, I contacted Miss Helen and I asked her what we could do to help. And so our students are going to go and help them put together all the supplies for in preparation for that Saturday. And she's so excited to have us coming. So I know that'll be a good time. And so do, try to get your students to come to that. They won't want to miss that. The other thing I want to mention to you is August the 25th. That Wednesday night, we're going to have our Aftershock relaunch with our Wednesday night Bible studies back after the busy summer that we've had. And uh, so we're looking forward to kind of having a celebration of all that God has done this summer and looking forward to the school year ahead. Uh, I want to mention to you that our nominating committee is, is hard at work, um, and they have been, uh, they've met last week, we're meeting again this week. There's a, um, a tear-off on your trifold bulletin where there's some things that you can uh, list if you're interested in serving in some various places. Uh, fill out your name, check those boxes, and put that in the offering plate today. <coughs> Uh, we have one opportunity already that we know of in, in conjunction with our Wednesday nights. Uh, we would like to, uh, when we start back on our Wednesday nights in, in September, <clears throat> we would like to do our Wednesday night meal. And so we're going to need uh, several people to help us out with that. And so if you're interested in helping out preparing the food and uh, serving the food on Wednesday nights, if you would see Merrill Waters or contact the church office, we would love to plug you in there. 
<clears throat> also want to mention to you that there's a hymn sing coming up. That will be the fifth Sunday, so that's Sunday, August the 29th, and that will be from 6 to 8 p.m. And an ice cream social, is that right? And a ice, homemade ice cream social. So Only you masters of the uh, homemade ice cream <laughs> machines. What you say? Only if they bring the homemade ice cream. Well, that's what I'm, I'm getting to that part. <laughs> See? Right. Just got to catch up. So if you can make some homemade ice cream and come that evening, uh, that's going to be a good time. You get to... Uh, make some requests and see how obscure we can be to stump Pastor Mitch. That's, that's how I see it going in my head, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, with no further ado, let's go before the Lord in prayer and let's get to worshiping him. Father God, we love you. Lord, it is indeed a privilege to be here today, to be in your house, to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, singing songs of praise to you, for you are worthy. Lord, we pray that as Pastor Mitch brings the word, you would speak through him. Open our hearts and minds. Lord, fill this place with your spirit. We invite you here today. May it be a blessing to you, and may we be blessed in our being here today. Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
He is an amazing God. He is a risen King. He is Savior and Lord. Would you stand as we worship that amazing God today?
Yeah. 
praise offering to our great God. Whew. What a great comfort, his faithfulness. And he can break every chain that we face. Amen. forward at this time. Hallelujah. We get to go into a time of worship through giving. And you know, it's giving a lot is about the fact that God just continuously gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. And we have the opportunity to give back just a little bit, knowing that he can use it uh, in far better ways than we can even imagine to, uh, to bless himself and to further his kingdom. 
Carrie, would you lead us in prayer?
I'll never forget when I was in college. One Sunday morning, the pastor stepped up when it was his time to bring the word. And he started out by, he said, I want to apologize. It's been a busy week. It's been a crazy week. I had to visit folks in the hospital and I had to do this and I had to do that. And he went through a long litany of things that as pastors uh, we have to do. And when he got through listing that, he said, I just, I just want to be honest with you. I didn't have time to prepare a message for today. And after saying that, he stepped away from the pulpit and walked out of the room. And we're all just sitting there like, what? And my friend, who was the music minister there, uh, you know, was flipping through his hymnal like, okay, we've got to come up with a song here to sing. And, and then the pastor came back in the room and, and stepped back up to the pulpit and said, that's, you know, that's not true. Um, he was making a point. And, but it really, it really, really shocked us because he seemed so genuine and so sincere. And that was the point, after all. It reminded us the importance of being honest. And you know what? If he, had, if he was being honest and not just making a point, that would have been okay, too. Because sometimes it's hard to get it all fit in and to do everything that needs doing. You know that as well as I do. Sometimes you just feel like, I can't get it all done uh, in a week's time. There's seven days and you need eight, right? How many need that one extra day? So today we're going to look at the importance of honesty. And I want to start out by just uh, pointing out a few quotes from uh, some of our founding fathers and some significant persons. Thomas Jefferson said honesty is the first chapter of the book of wisdom. And Benjamin Franklin said honesty is the best policy. In fact, he's not the only one that said that, but he certainly did. Ronald Reagan said there are no degrees of honesty. No degrees of honesty. In other words, it is or it isn't. And then the elder statesman Billy Joel said, Honesty is such a lonely word. Everyone is so untrue. Honesty is hardly ever heard and mostly what I need from you. This morning as we continue our That's So Cliché message series, we're looking at honesty is the best policy. And we're going to spend time in the Old Testament book of wisdom, Proverbs, looking at chapter 11, the first nine verses. So I invite you to stand. And I want you to repeat after me, but only if you're being honest. Okay? I believe the Bible. It is the Word of God. Every Word of God is true. And I will receive it gladly. And wherewith the Bible says is different from my life. I will change through the power of God's Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 11, the first nine verses. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. When pride comes, then comes dishonor, but with the humble there's wisdom. The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the perversity of the treacherous will destroy them. Riches do not benefit on the day of wrath, but righteousness rescues from death. The righteousness of the blameless will smooth his way, but the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. The righteousness of the upright will rescue them, but the treacherous will be caught by their own greed. When a wicked person dies, his expectation will perish, and the hope of strong people perishes. The righteous is rescued from trouble, but the wicked takes his place. With his mouth, the godless person destroys his neighbor, but through knowledge, the righteous will be rescued. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated.
I would argue that most folks in our society, and maybe even in our world, have a knowledge of the importance of honesty. Many even seek to operate honestly in their dealings with other people. Maybe even most of the time. I hope that is true. Although sometimes it's hard to believe that. Honesty is so important in our dealings, in our speech. Honesty is indeed the best policy. And we're going to look at Proverbs here. We know this is the book of wisdom and it offers a lot of just statements, wisdom statements that, that tell us uh, what we need to know. And, and this passage here, we could have actually used chapter 10. We could have continued on in chapter 11, but I just wanted to hone in on these nine verses that give us sort of an either-or picture, an either-or scenario. Uh, here's what things look like on the honest side of things. Here's what things look like when we're not being honest. So how many of you remember this guy right here? Raise your hand if you remember that guy. Yeah. And what's his name? All right. Wile E. Coyote. He's got a business card he's going to show you right here. Uh, that gives you his name. Wile E. Coyote. And what does it say underneath that? Genius. Yeah. Right. Uh, he thinks he's a genius. And, and, and what company did he keep in business? Acme. He kept the Acme company in business, didn't he? Because he was constantly buying stuff from them, trying to catch the roadrunner. Wild E. Coyote. So his name was based on what he was about. He was wily. And wily, uh, wiliness has to do with being crafty, being deceitful, being cunning. Now, I didn't say he was any good at it. But he tried awful hard, didn't he? He was crafty and deceitful and cunning. And so we're going to look at the fact this morning that wiliness in our lives curtails. In other words, it, it reduces uh, or diminishes or cuts short all that God intends for us. When we're trying to be wily, the outcome may be as good in the short term, maybe. But in the long term, where it really, really matters, it cuts short and diminishes all that God would have for us. Wiliness curtails. And what we see here in verse number 1 of chapter 11 of Proverbs, it says this, uh, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord. That word false, meaning deceit and treachery. And the balance is referencing the scales. And you know those old school scales that had a dish on this side and a dish on this side and they were hanging by chains. And the design was that they would hang perfectly even when nothing was on either side. And then you would put a, a measurement of weight, some, something that you already knew and agreed upon weighed so much on one side. And then you would put whatever uh, product or whatever you were trying to weigh on the other side until it balanced out. And in business, sometimes people would fudge just a little bit and they would add something or subtract something so that what looked like it was balanced and even was actually not. And it was benefiting the person that was trying to sell something to you or the person that was trying to, to uh, make some money. It would benefit them and it would detract from the person who was trying to buy something. And so it's, scripture says that that kind of attitude. When we're not being up front. Is an abomination. Anything or anybody that's detestable to God. Because they're contrary to his nature. Is what an abomination is. Anything contrary to the nature of God. The Lord. The one true God. So false measurement is something that is a problem. There's an old Yiddish proverb that says, A half-truth is a whole lie. Now what is it that we are asked to say when we are testifying in a court of law 
and we have our hand on the Bible, what are we asked to say? I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and then so help me God. And that's important because so help me God, I can't tell the truth if it weren't for Him. He helps me. Uh, but it's important to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Moving to verse 2, we see that not only is a false measurement a problem, but also a false, false merit. And it says, when pride comes, then comes dishonor. Now this is specifically referring to prophets who would sometimes prophesy or predict something that was going to happen except that they had not gotten a word from the Lord. And we see this in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22. It says this, When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, and the thing does not happen or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You are not to be afraid of him. And that false pride, that false prediction is not worthy of praise or of honor. And it brings personal shame and disgrace to the person who gives it. So we ought not walk around with a false merit proclaiming things that we do not know to be factual and true. Zig Ziglar once said, honesty and integrity are absolutely essential for success in life, all areas of life. The really good news is that anyone can develop both honesty and integrity. And that is good news because if you're not raised that way, then you certainly sort of have an excuse of how you've started out. But there's never too late to start being honest, to start living with integrity, and to start doing things the right way, to stop being wily. And God can help us with that. We see in verse 3, it says, The perversity of the treacherous will destroy them. This is false morals. In other words, uh, those who are dealing in a crooked manner, crooked dealings. And that word treacherous there, uh, the perversity of the treacherous is the deceitful or the unfaithful man. And it says, that will destroy them, devastate them, ruin them. Now, I know sometimes we look at people who are living in this kind of way, who are being deceitful and unfaithful, and we think, man, when are they ever going to get what's coming to them? And sometimes it doesn't seem like they ever do. In fact, sometimes they don't until they face the judgment. But they always get what's coming to them. Ruin and destruction is coming their way. But wiliness doesn't get us anywhere. False measurements, false merit, false morals are not the way we want to live our lives. And we're going to look at the, the opposite end of the spectrum here in just a little bit. Ann Landers said, The naked truth is always better than the best dressed lie. Now, for any of you younger folks in here, if you don't know who that is, ask one of our senior saints, and they can tell you about Ann Landers. So we see there in the first three verses, wiliness, not where we want to be, not what we want to be about. Moving to verse 4, we look at the fact that wealthiness derails. And it is based on a security which is really unfounded. In other words, we have no reason to be secure, but we have a false sense of security in our wealth or in our riches. And verse 4 says this, riches do not benefit on the day of wrath. You've heard the old saying, you've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? You can't take it with you. But think about the Egyptians, those pyramids. And they put all that stuff on the inside 
when they buried the kings and, and royal people uh, because they thought, well, hey, on the other side, they're going to need all this stuff. And they thought they could take it with them. But see, it's a security unfounded when we believe in our riches and in our wealth because they will not benefit us on the day of wrath. That's pointing back to the previous verse that said it's all going to catch up with them in the end. Riches have no benefit or no value on that day of Yahweh when He comes to judge and to judge with fury. Milton Berle once said, money can't buy you happiness, it just helps you look for it in more places. Or sometimes you hear nicer places. And I've seen other quotes that say, money just affords you the opportunity to be miserable in fancier places. But the point is that money is not going to be the answer to happiness. Wealthiness is not the answer to happiness. And ultimately it derails us from doing what God would have us to do. And we don't want that. We want to do what God wants us to do. And so that unfounded security that we see in verse 4 leads to an unbounded sinfulness. Something without boundaries the righteous uh the wicked will fall by his own wickedness the morally wrong the ungodly those who are not behaving as they should the wicked will fall or go to ruin will perish by their own wickedness and this word here their own wickedness is actually referencing in civil relations and, and that could be in a business dealing like we talked about with the unbalanced scales. But those kinds of things are ultimately going to catch up with you. The wicked will fall by their own wickedness. They will be found out at some point. And that sinfulness uh, seems like there's no limits to it. It's unrestrained and uncontrolled. But God is always there and He's going to bring it around according to his perfect timing and his perfect plan. There was a, a book written a number of years ago, back in 1991, a survey had been done that showed that two-thirds of Americans polled would agree to at least one of the following things, and some of them to several of the following things, regarding what they would be willing to do for $10 million dollars. So for $10 million, 25% of the people surveyed would abandon their entire family. 25% would abandon their church. 23% would become a prostitute for a week. 16% would give up their American citizenship. 16% would leave their spouse. 10% would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free. 7% would kill a stranger. And 3% would put their children up for adoption. It was in a book by James Patterson and Peter Kim called The Day America Told the Truth. You see, sometimes we let desires for worldly riches get in the way of that which is much better. Eternal riches. We see in verse 6 that that unfounded security and that unbounded sinfulness leads to a selfishness that is surrounding us. The, the treacherous will be caught, the treacherous will be caught by their own greed. Uh, that word caught means in a snare or in a trap. It's talking about God's judgment. The treacherous will be caught. By their own greed, their own naughtiness is the word there. In the King James Version it says their own selfish desires. But let me give you an important warning from Admiral Akbar. It's a trap. Selfishness, treacherousness, being caught up in your own greed. It's a trap. We don't want to go there. But here's what the Lord said. The Lord said, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the implication there is, not that a rich man can't get into heaven, he certainly can. The implication is that the rich man is more inclined to trust in himself 
and to trust in His riches. But it's important to remember that that kind of selfishness and treacherousness is actually a trap that will come back to bite us. We see in verse 7, uh, we get to talking about wickedness and what it looks like. And wickedness travails. In other words, it toils and exerts itself. And sometimes you, you look at the wicked and you say, man, it's, it's so easy for them to just go out and do what they do and to reap the benefits. But actually, the wicked uh, have to work at it because they constantly have to feed the beast. To feed the beast of dissatisfaction, not having enough, not having all that you want to have. They have to feed the beast of addiction. And the wicked are constantly working toward meeting that hole, filling that void that's in their lives. And we as believers in Jesus Christ, we know what that void can be filled by. The only thing it can be filled by is the Lord Jesus Christ. But we see in verse 7 it says, When a wicked person dies, his expectation, or in other words, the things that he hoped for, the outcomes that uh, they were working toward are unfinished. They will perish. They will die. They will cease to exist. All those strivings stop. And it says this, And the hope of strong people perishes. In the King James, that word says unjust people. Strong people. In other words, people that are exerting themselves often in vain because they are trying things without God. They are trying to accomplish the things that God would not have them to do. And it says the hope of strong people perishes. The wicked person, his expectation perishes. Hope is denied. You never reach what you're striving towards. Josh Billings who was, uh, it was a pen name for a 19th century American humorist. Uh, his name was Henry Wheeler Shaw. He was often compared to Mark Twain. And he would go around the country uh, lecturing in the United States and writing. And during the latter half of that 19th century, and he said, it is a statistical fact that the wicked work harder to reach hell than the righteous do to enter heaven. What we see here is those labors if they're not labors towards the things of God, are always in vain. Wickedness travails. So we see a hope denied, and in verse 8, we see that heartache presides over that kind of life. The righteous is rescued from trouble, but the wicked takes his place. In other words, trouble and emotional pain or distress or sorrow or grief, those kinds of things that we don't want to face in life, that we try to avoid in life are going to come because the wicked are not going to be rescued from trouble the way the righteous are. And they're going to take the place of the righteous there in trouble instead of the righteous. Martin Luther King Jr. said, The time is always right to do what is right. And we ought to remember that. We see in verse 9 that the wickedness travails and there is a hurt applied. It says, with his mouth the godless person destroys his neighbor. The godless person, the hypocrite, the one who is living a lie, destroys his neighbor, those people around him, his fellow citizens. With the mouth, that organ of speech, we know that the tongue is a dangerous thing. And the truth is that people most often put others down, tear others down, destroy their neighbor when they're trying to make themselves feel better. It's based on a discontentment, not being happy with who you are or what you have, not being satisfied with the blessings that you have from God. In Matthew 5, 6, we see these words, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the things that are good, the things that are of God, that's what we need to be about. So we're going to drop back and look through that same passage again and look at the opposite end of the statement each time. It says, 
just weight, in verse 1, a just weight is his delight. In other words, it's perfect. It's even. It's fair. It's balanced. Is the delight of the Lord. In other words, it's acceptable in his sight. Acceptable in God's sight as opposed to that false dealings and false balance. A just weight is his delight. And in verse 2 it says, with the humble there is wisdom. In other words, those of us who are, are modest and free from vanity and boastfulness, who recognize who we are in light of who he is, we have a wisdom that comes from the fear of God and from the knowledge of God and God's things. We get that wisdom when we see ourselves in the proper light. God's delight and direction we see in verse 3, the integrity of the upright will guide them. In other words, it will instruct us, will let us know what we need to know. God's delight is in us dealing fairly with the people around us. And He will give us direction. Not only direction to do those kinds of things, but continued direction as we continue to follow His will and His way. But in verses 4 through 6, we see about God's rescue and refining in our lives. Verse 4 says, But righteousness rescues from death. It delivers us from death. Now, do we all die? Yes, we do. The wages of sin is death. We are all sinners. But when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, He delivers us from the consequence. And He has taken that shame upon Himself at the cross. He rescues us and delivers us from death. Verse 5 says, The righteousness of the blameless will smooth His way. The ethically right and we've talked about the fact that we cannot be righteous without God and without God's help but the righteousness that uh, the those that are ethically correct and right of the blameless those men of integrity living in integrity will smooth his way in other words God's going to Make straight and free from obstacles your course of life and undertakings. Now that doesn't mean we're not going to face some, some difficulties. That doesn't mean we're, we're just going to have smooth sailing all the way. But God is going to smooth the way. And He is going to help us through all of that. Because He's constantly there with us. And He's constantly refining us. Sometimes through the situations that we face. And in verse 6 it says the righteousness of the upright will rescue them. The upright among the people of God as distinguished from the wicked. So if you call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, then we fall into that category. And God is continually, He has rescued us and is continually refining us for His purposes. Working toward righteousness and honesty and integrity in all our dealings. We also see in verses 7 through 9 God's intervention and His instruction. Verse 7 says, uh, it's talking about the expectations that perish, the hope that no longer exists in people that are working towards things that are not of God. But we see in verse 8 that the righteous, those that are just in their conduct and in their character, will be rescued from trouble from tough situations, from tight spots, from distress, from dire straits. Our only hope, our always hope, is in the Lord. And in verse 9, we said, Through, the no through knowledge, the righteous will be rescued. Through knowledge, the discernment and the understanding of a biblical nature that God gives us as we live in righteousness, not our own, but His righteousness. So it's important, and we've seen this throughout this passage, to live lives of integrity, to live lives that are honest. And really it boils down to the fact that life is a series of choices between right and wrong. And honesty is always going to point us 
in the right direction. Life is also a series of choices between true or false. Think about it. Everything we hear, everything we see is either the truth or a lie. Biblical wisdom is your best bet to discern the honest over the dishonest, to know the, the right way, to know the truthful way. And then the most consequential choice of all is life or death. Our one choice of consequence in living is whether or not we will experience eternal life or eternal death. And we need to be honest about this with the world around us. We need to be honest that it doesn't just end at the end of this life, but that we are all destined for eternal existence, either eternal life or eternally dying. To paraphrase Jesus, he put it this way, you need some direction? I am the way. You want to know what's good and what's real? I am the truth. Wondering how to avoid the second death? I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Honesty. That's what it's all about. Honesty is how we should strive to live our lives. Being honest. Having integrity as we see in this passage of Scripture and in so many others, gets us where God wants us to be. But the opposite is, we've also seen where we get if we're not living lives of honesty. As we go into our time of decision this morning, I invite you to come forward if the Lord leads you to do that. Pastor Justin will be here at the front. Use these steps as an altar for anything that the Lord may be speaking to you about or that you need to speak to the Lord about. Of course, you can speak to the Lord right where you are. There in your seat as we stand. Let's pray together, then we'll sing our closing song. Father God, we thank you and praise you for who you are. We thank you that we sang from the beginning of our time together this morning that you are faithful. Great is your faithfulness. And Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Your faithfulness <coughs> that gives us confidence to know that because you've done it once, you'll do it again. We thank you, Lord, that you are always faithful and always true. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Help us to follow you each and every moment. Holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. Is what I long for. Faithfulness is what I need. Faithfulness, faithfulness is what you want from me. So take my
Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want of me. So take my Justin, if you'll come on up here and, and do our closing prayer in just a moment. Thank you for coming today. If you are visiting with us, we're glad that you chose to be here today. And uh, we hope that you'll choose to be with us again. For those that are online, we're so glad that you have chosen to join us in that way as well. And uh, as we go to our time of Bible study, Pastor Justin, if you'll close us in prayer. allow your word to reverberate in our hearts and minds. Lord, as we go to Sunday school, as we go about our week, Father, would you go with us? Help us to be a shining example of who you are, a light into a dark world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.